Good morning. Welcome to this webinar, which will review the accreditation readiness report. As a reminder, the information provided in this webinar is the property of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education and reproduction, distribution, or transmission of the presentation in part or in whole is expressly prohibited without prior written consent from the commission. This morning, our presenters are myself, Diana Bonner, Assistant Director for Institutional Support Services with the Commission, and my colleague, Dr. Sean A. McKittrick, Vice President for Institutional Field Relations. Our learning outcomes today will be understanding the various steps of the application candidacy review cycle and monitoring procedures with an emphasis on preparing the institution for the assessment team visit. Understanding the value of mission-centered peer review for institutional preparation and improvement in the application process. Defining the purpose and role of the accreditation readiness report in the context of applying for candidate for accreditation status. Identifying the expectations for compliance with the Middle States standards for accreditation and requirements of affiliation, policies and procedures, and applicable federal regulatory requirements while using the accreditation readiness report. And finally, understanding the role of evidence and documentation in preparing a complete accreditation readiness report. For those of you who are new or just becoming oriented to the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, I'd like to present a few introductory uh, remarks and some information. Here we see some statistics on Middle States institutions. Our member institutions uh, are 523 in number and they represent approximately 4.5 million students. Institutions are located in 23 jurisdictions, including 14 international locales. So I wanna talk a bit about um, some of the expectations for middle states compliance that uh, I spoke of earlier. One of the first areas, the most important is the requirements of affiliation. There are 15 requirements to be eligible for and to achieve and to maintain MSCHE accreditation. An institution must demonstrate that it fully meets the requirements of affiliation once eligibility is established, an institution then must demonstrate an on, on an ongoing basis that it meets the requirements of affiliation. Compliance will be validated periodically, typically at the time of an institutional self-study and during any other evaluation of the institution's compliance. These requirements are varied in their range and scope. The first two requirements, for example, Institutions must demonstrate that they are authorized to operate and are operational with students enrolled in their degree programs. These are demonstrated through verification that the students or through documents that, uh, or charters that the state governments have uh, allowed the institution to operate as an institution of higher education. There are other requirements that involve the provision of more extensive information about faculty programs or the institution's governance structure. The second 
area that I want to talk about are the standards for accreditation. There are seven standards for accreditation. They encompass all of the activities that the entire institution is involved with. Although there are points of overlap, each standard addresses a specific area of institutional life. The overlaps include assessment, governance, mission, and strategic planning. The Middle States Commission on Higher Education Standards for Accreditation and Requirements of Affiliation serve as an ongoing guide for those institutions considering application for membership. Those accepted as candidate institutions and also those accredited institutions engaged in self-review and peer evaluation. Accredited institutions are expected to demonstrate compliance with these standards and requirements to conduct their activities in a manner consistent with the standards and requirements and to engage in ongoing processes of self-review and improvement. Although self-study process occurs every eight years, compliance with the requirements of affiliation and standards for accreditation is expected to be continuous. And for applicant institutions, these are the standards that must be met prior to the grant of candidacy. Additionally, institutions are expected to demonstrate continuous compliance with federal compliance requirements, as well as the MSCHE policies and procedures. So let's talk a little bit about the application process. The application process contains three general phases, a pre-application, application, and the grant of candidate status. So today we're focusing on the application. In the pre-application, I just want to mention, there are seven areas of minimum requirements that the institution must demonstrate that they meet. Uh, once those areas are met and the commission um, agrees that those areas have been met, the commission allows the institution to move forward into the application process. The application process, uh, it, again, is what we will be focusing on today and specifically the accreditation readiness report, uh, which is the report by means of which the institution will demonstrate compliance with the standards for accreditation the requirements of affiliation, the MSCHE policies and procedures, and applicable federal regulatory requirements. And then the final phase uh, for an institution, should they have been successful in the application process, is the process for the grant of candidate status. So all of these areas and the application process itself is focused upon the application and candidacy review cycle and monitoring policy and procedures. This process has been organized to ensure four aspects that are important to the commission, consistency, equity, fairness, and rigor. Decisions about moving forward in the process are made by peers and not staff. However, staff plays an important role, facilitating many opportunities for applicant and candidate institutions to obtain advice, guidance, and support in meeting commission expectations. Remember, advice and guidance from staff is helpful, but it does not guarantee a favorable outcome. So as noted on the commission's website, institutions that progress through the three stages of the application process must demonstrate that they meet the commission's standards for accreditation, requirements, 
of affiliation, policies and procedures, and ap applicable federal regular, regulatory requirements. The application review contains several elements, a letter of intent to apply, which is a formal letter from the institution's CEO uh, indicating its intent to apply for candidate for accreditation status, an information session in which staff members of MSCHE will share uh, information about the process and expectations moving forward, as well as uh, outline a, a potential schedule for the institution and its submissions. An applicant annual institution update or data collection. An applicant commission liaison visit in which a staff member will visit the institution to discuss further commission expectations, feedback that may have been given in the pre-application process from peer evaluators and next steps in the process. Of course, the accreditation readiness report and the evidence, accreditation readiness uh, report is the foundation for this part of the process as I've already stated. And that is a very important document that will take much time and consideration in preparing. And again, the staff is available to help in supporting and guiding the institution and providing advice. Um, however, in general, the staff will not read draft versions of the accreditation readiness report and give feedback. Um, however, the staff again is available for advice and we'll get more into the details of uh, how that um, works once we get to that portion of the program this, this uh, morning. So let's talk a little bit about the applicant assessment team. Uh, in the previous slide, you may have noticed that uh, there is a review report and then there is an opportunity for the institution uh, and their submission to move forward through the uh, three levels of review. They include the peer evaluators who, are, who make up the applicant assessment team, as well as the committee process by which the commission looks at the materials uh, and the committee of the commission makes a recommendation to the full committee. And then the full committee is actually who is going to make a decision about the status of the institution. So the first level of review is the applicant assessment team. At an appropriate time, the applicant assessment team will be selected for your institution and will consist of team members and a chair. Uh, the, the staff assigns the team of peer evaluators in accordance with uh, the commission's policy on peer evaluators and the procedures on the selection and assignment of peer evaluators. The team chair is a member of the Committee on Applicant and Candidate Institutions. Depending on the size and complexity of the institution, the team includes three to five members. And those members, again, are selected from our wider pool of peer evaluators. Those members are carefully selected in accordance with uh, their expertise. They have been trained for the applicant assessment process. And um, in most cases, they will uh, have particular expertise in similar, um, in working with similar institutions as those that are in the application process. And finally, the commission staff liaison assists the team and provides interpretation and clarification of the commission's policies, procedures, and expectations. So with that, let's get into the meat of the accreditation readiness report. And for this, I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. McKittrick. Thank you, Diana, for that uh, 
great presentation. Um, so let's get into a little bit more detail. Let's turn to specifics, the accreditation readiness report. The first here on this slide, you see the first page. Um, please note uh, that completion of a verification of compliance process is mandatory as part of this process. Please review the booklet, complete the report, and include the resulting documentation under standard two, ethics and integrity, criterion eight. The first page, as you note, as you may notice here, contains uh, gen generic instructions, but toward the bottom, it's very important that when submitting the accreditation readiness report, obviously the name of the institution, the chief executive officer, the application manager, and the submission date. A note about the application manager is, is necessary. And that is that it should not be understood that the application manager is the only person responsible for loading information into the app, uh, accreditation readiness report. It'll be very important to work with your fellow stakeholders at your institution to make this a team effort. Next slide, if you could. So you will be required to complete um, a um, number of uh, dates or identify a number of dates to identify that, uh, that the accreditation readiness report is either the first submission or otherwise and then indicate the dates of those submissions. So if this would be your first submission, you would um, indicate such. If this were a second or a third um, uh, submission, then you would uh, go down the rows uh, to make sure that your audience understands that it isn't the first submission. To note that it is not abnormal for an institution to go through an iterative, iterative process with the commission. Uh, it's not abnormal at all. Um, oftentimes there's a, there's a second submission that is required by the commission and it would likely be necessary for you to inform your leadership that that is indeed uh, um, common amongst our um, uh, applicant institutions that more than one cycle is necessary. Next slide, if you could. So we want to encourage you to, it, it is required to make sure to complete the section on baseline scope of accreditation. This helps us know more about your institution so that we can uh, really use this as contextual information that will help us understand the submission. It will be important to uh, check the credential levels uh, offered um, by your institution indicate whether you offer alternative delivery methods um, and to indicate what your branch campuses are, if any, uh, indicate what your additional locations are and indicate your other individual um, instructional sites. Very important because these will oftentimes, well, they will find themselves into commission records and um, and uploading information would be necessary for uh, evaluators uh, to conduct their review. Remember also that for distance education, um, it would be important to click that box if you um, offer any distance education courses. Next slide, please. So the accreditation readiness report um, also contains a list of the commission's requirements of affiliation. Here on this slide, you will find it um, in, in the table uh, to the left where the requirements of affiliation are listed. Um, it contains then, the AR, ARR contains a list of the commission's requirements of affiliation and instructions about where to provide information demonstrating compliance with each. Notice that evidence for this section will only be required for the first, um, for the first number of requirements and evidence for the remaining requirements of affiliation will be provided with uh, the corresponding standards as noted here uh, um, in items number three, five, and six. 
Um, so maybe this is a good place to define what we mean by evidence. Remember that evidence in our view are documents, descriptions of processes, policies, procedures, those sorts of things that will enable evaluators to understand uh, the extent to which your institution is in compliance with commission expectations. Next slide. Note also that, that um, the required evidence for this section, um, for, for you'll find required evidence for many standards. Um, these need to be addressed and where it states in the accreditation readiness report that there will be required evidence um, it certainly is required and evaluators will look for that information. The required evidence for this section in particular are that there's a documentation of degree granting authority and licensing. Note that if the institution operates in more than one jurisdiction, you should provide uh, the uh, a degree granting authorization for each. And the institution needs, as indicated here on this slide, in enrollment, uh, enrollment profile data. The purpose of this evidence is to demonstrate that the institution is operational, that it has graduated at least one class, and, um, and that you can uh, show the evaluators that that, has, that, that that is indeed confirmable. Next slide. Now, the accreditation readiness report, as Diana has said, contains this, um, invitations to provide information for our seven standards. Um, and, and we'll look at this a little bit in more detail in a few moments. But I want to emphasize here the first arrow, red arrow. Um, uh, in, we, we want you to include narrative here. Um, we want you to take advantage of an opportunity to provide a narrative where you demonstrate how your institution meets the standard. Do not forget about providing information for this section as it provides information to evaluators about how to interpret compliance within the context of your institution's mission and goals, um, your institution's history, and other important information. The intent here is to not give us a 20 pager. The intent here is to provide the evaluators with concise information that is important for them to understand so that they can evaluate uh, the uh, following standard. That note that although there is a box included in this section, uh, this, this is only here as a placeholder, your narrative may be one or more pages and you do not need to limit yourself um, to this box. It may indeed expand, but please, again, it needs to be concise and it needs to be straightforward. Uh, next slide, please. Sean, before we move to the next slide, I wanna point out a question regarding the other instructional sites related to the contextual information in the previous slide. So it can, may I move backwards just one? Of course, please. Okay. So the question is how much, there we are, how much instruction needs to happen for an other instructional site to be listed? Is there an off-campus laboratory site that is used once or twice a year? Does that need to be listed in this area? Right. So most institutions do. So it's interesting. I was analyzing that this morning um, as part of another pro project. Uh, if, you're, if you have formal uh, instruction occurring at another site, those are candidates for including those in the accreditation readiness report. It's important that they have a sense of where your instruction is indeed occurring. I would refer you to our policy and processes documents um, uh, regarding additional locations, branch campuses. You also would find information in uh, the substantive change policy. Thank you, that's a very good question. Thank you, Sean. You bet. So I should also add that Please refrain, refrain from providing information in the form of web links 
Um, I don't know about you, but um, um, I may think that everything is perfect in terms of a web link and something happens in the middle and the web link breaks. And so it's very important uh, not to provide those unless we prompt you to do so. It's important to keep in mind that we want to obviously serve the evaluator with, uh, as directly as possible with the information uh, that they need to conduct their review. Um, I will note here that here we give you an example of standard one and their criteria. So notice here we uh, provide you with criteria three and four. You see where it says standard one criteria in the first column and the box on the top. So here um, are, are the standard one criteria and then to the column to the right, you have the list of supporting evidence. That's where you would provide that. And then you'll also note that we provide uh, the requirements of affiliation that align with uh, standard one. And then um, we ask you that you provide a narrative about compliance with this standard. Um, you are given the opportunity to provide this additional narrative regarding compliance with these requirements of affiliation and with the criterion that you are listing documentation for. Um, and so it's very important that you provide narrative information just like before that would enable evaluators uh, to uh, do their work. For example, if you're a graduate graduate only institution, and although we would catch that prior to this point in the accreditation readiness report, it's very helpful for evaluators to be reminded that general education it would not be part of this review if you are indeed a graduate only institution. Um, there are other things that might apply that we might need to know about. And so providing this narrative uh, would be critical uh, to the application. Next slide. Where applicable, and again, it's where applicable, the final section of each standard contains a listing of required evidence. And as I noted before, uh, required means required, of course. And here is an example where we do ask for a URL, you know, to the most recent version of your institution's catalog. Again, if you do provide the URL, please make sure that it works and that um, the evaluators are able to click on it and go directly to the catalogs. Uh, you do not want to have a situation where they have to click three or four times in order to get to the catalog. It's the direct URL. And then, of course, other information that we would like to see is graduation requirements for each educational program, indications of academic rigor, faculty data, faculty profile, and information about the library. Um, Sean, I have another question. Sure. Uh, and it's regarding uh, what you said about URL links and um, the evidence inventory references. So if the reference information is significant in size, such as a catalog, as you, as you uh, indicated, or is only provided online and not in a printed format, um, the use of URLs is permitted? In this case, yes, you would. Because in this case, the URL is the recent version of the institution's catalog. I think what we're talking about is if you have URLs for almost everything uh, and you are not uh, formally prompted to do so by the commission, that could be a problem. You do not want to have pepper the accreditation readiness report with so many web links that they're going to break. In this case, we do prompt you to provide uh, the, web, the web link. But again, please make sure that they work. That's critical, most important piece. Thanks, Sean. You bet. Next question. No, I mean, next slide. So I do want to speak about key steps to building the accreditation readiness report. I, I tell my institutions all the time that 
you're going to look at the accreditation readiness report. You're going to look at the requirements of affiliation. You're going to look at the standards. You're going to look at the um, required evidence. And then you're going to say, oh my goodness, this is a lot of work. And some of you are going to be very nervous and say, that's it. Um, you know, this is a setup to fail. It is not. Um, as long as you understand that the gathering of evidence is an iterative process. It is like sculpture, if you will. Um, it is, you start oftentimes, and forgive me, you artists out there, if I'm misrepresenting this, but you start with a lump of clay and you begin to refine, refine, refine before you produce it to the, in the art show or whatever it may be. The first phase in building a successful accreditation readiness report is to gather initial evidence. Ask yourself, what evidence do I have that will demonstrate as directly as possible that my institution is in compliance with each of the criterion of each standard and with the relevant requirements of affiliation? You should not be overly nervous if you go through the first pass and you have a lot of empty rows. We don't like empty rows when it comes to the applicant committee process, obviously, but if you're going through this at the first, uh, as a first pass, your job is to gather initial evidence and then consult with others. So you remember when I said at the beginning that when you identify yourself as a program manager, that you, that should not be an indication of the only person who knows anything about middle states, knows anything about the process. Well, this is an example where consulting with others is critical in being successful in building the accreditation readiness report. In consulting with others, you will then hopefully be able to refine uh, your evidence inventory, uh, take out things that might be overly duplicative, add things that you may have missed, and then um, build references so it becomes obvious to outsiders that the, that, uh, the information that they access contains what the ARR purports to offer the evaluators. At some point, You'll be required to upload evidence, and but that doesn't mean that throughout this, the um, uh, application or even the candidacy process that you're not going to continuously refine and use it. All of our member institutions, wh whatever the phase might be, are uh, invited, if not heavily urged, to refine their evidence inventory because as time goes on, things might change. And that's why also the context information is important to help us understand uh, what is in the evidence, you know, is in the accreditation readiness report. Next slide. Sean, before we move on, we have sure. one more question about URLs and that's if it's behind a firewall. And I think in this case, we would need to work individually with that institution and the end um, have our IT support staff and the institution's IT support staff work together in order to overcome that difficulty. Yeah, thank you. It's very important that the evaluators be able to access the information. So yeah, there needs to be some conversation about how that information will be accessible. This brings me to my next point. That's It's terrific that we're going to our next point. And that is that using these expectations about the accreditation readiness report, um, we did um, about a year ago reach out to evaluators at Middle States member institutions and together we, um, uh, we identified four uh, overarching aspects of what make of evidence quality. And in this case, what makes a good accreditation readiness report. The first, which we just talked about, right, is accessibility. Um, evidence for each criterion that you upload um, should be retrievable in ways that enable users to access the information that is needed 
even when they are not familiar with the institution. Access is going to be very important. Thus, what we just talked about, about if it's behind a firewall, there needs to be a strategy for ensuring that um, those URLs will be accessible. The second aspect is it needs to be accurate. Uh, evidence is that you upload is sufficient. Um, I'm sorry, the evidence provided for this criterion is technically correct and current. This is not the time for us to understand the status of institutional assessment in 1971. This is not the time. Uh, we want to know, get, have a, be able to have a snapshot of what um, of, of your status which e with each criterion now. Um, and then you'll build upon that into the future, hopefully, if you move on to um, further on in the application and even in the candidacy process. The third aspect is comprehensiveness. The evidence that you provide in the accreditation readiness report is sufficient to address compliance with this criterion, both institution-wide and where applicable for individual units. So for example, standard five educational effectiveness assessment, we're gonna, for, if you're an undergraduate institute, institution, you only under, uh, offer undergraduate programs, for example, across the institution would be evidence of assessment in general education. Um, but we would also want to know uh, about compliance with the criterion uh, with regard to individual programs. So when we say both institution-wide and where applicable for individual units or programs, that's what we mean by it. And finally, fourth is evidence provided for this criterion is concise and enables users to perform their work in a timely fashion. What um, evaluators in the past have shared with us is that sometimes the labeling is left wanting. So if a criteria, if you're trying to demonstrate documents for a criterion having to do with general education assessment, it's probably a good idea to use the commission's language for that. So if your general education program is called core curriculum, or it's called the um, steps to success or something like that, it might be good to, in the reference, put something like general education learning outcomes or something of that sort. I mean, it's okay to use your institutional lingo, but it's also important to reach out to, um, to our language as well, because the evaluators obviously do not work for your institution. Next slide, if you could. So here's an example used with permission from Pennsylvania College of Health Sciences used for their self-study process as they have been a member institution with us. Notice on the first column, uh, they list the criterion, they copy and paste the criterion, and then the evidence that they provide um, references each criterion and then lists what could be found in each. So when you build a, a um, accreditation readiness report, it's important to think very carefully about what kinds of evidence um, should be provided and how it should be labeled. Now, we're not going, we don't have a, uh, a perfect world expectation for labeling and all of that, but it should be reasonable enough to allow an outsider to be able to access the information they need to confirm um, or to clarify um, compliance with each criterion. Slide if you could. So let's, let's look at some examples of evidence by standards. So Diane and I, sort of looked at these sorts of things and, 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 and I thought about some examples of some, um, some evidence. But I do, before we do that, I do want us to know and want to note 
that there are many, many valid approaches. Again, there are over 500 member institutions. We have, we have several candidate institutions. We have several applicants and we have a number of pre-applicants and every institution is different. And so um, what we have to share here are not the only examples and please do not um, see this as the only way or the only documents that would be appropriate for review. But I simply, we simply share these with you as examples of what other campuses have used in the past, because there are many, many good practices throughout the commission. Next slide. So for example, let's take a look at standard one. So if you are populating uh, accreditation readiness report for, um, for standard one. Uh, the relevant requirements of affiliation as cited in the accreditation uh, readiness report are requirements number seven, eight, and 10, which generally have to do with strategic planning and goals and that, those sorts of things. And then to the right, I simply provide the most common documents that's that are provided. So one of the most common documents provided in standard one to demonstrate the use of mission and goals is the strategic plan. Uh, the second most common is the mission vision and value statement or the mission statement. Clearly, right? Because the mission, mission and goals, there needs to be a mission statement. Some institutions want to provide the Board of Trustees meeting minutes where they approve the new mission statement, or there's discussion about evaluation of the mission statement and of institutional goals and of strategic planning goals. There's key performance indicators. Um, there's diversity, equity, and inclusion plans because that's considered critical to the mission of the institution or to an institution's goals. There are many different types of documents, but some really most critical examples are policies and procedures of the review and development of processes for mission and strategic goals with evidence that stakeholders are involved in the process. Many institutions use key performance indicators as, it relate, as they relate to the strategic plan. Um, they uh, provide planning documentation that shows how stakeholders have considered the mission of the institution. Some institutions have even looked at budgeting documents, uh, budgeting approval documents, where there have been checklists, you know, about what element of mission does this request. None of this is necessarily required, but they are examples of, of institutions that have used such documents because it seemed to be especially useful for them. Next slide. For standard two, um, you might note that the accreditation readiness report references requirements of affiliation one, five, six, seven, and 14, um, because ethics and integrity relate to things such as governance. They relate to things such as uh, compliance with uh, public or regular, uh, um, of state regulations, of federal regulations, and those sorts of things. So some of the most common documents that are referenced by institutions in, the accredited, in, in their self-study documents have to do with financial aid and scholarship information, such as, uh, as required by the federal government to provide appropriate disclosures to students. Um, complaint procedures and grievances per Title IX regulations and other federal regulations, code of conduct or, or ethics or honor code information. Um, these are just a, a couple of examples, but institutions have been successful in providing things like climate study results and how information has been used to ensure compliance with, say, student code of conduct expectations and so forth. Standard. Um, so for example, um, for compliance with federal regulation, this is where, if I remember right, it is criterion eight. Um, 
to in, in order to demonstrate compliance with federal regulation in order to help us verify everything there are several things that we need you to look for or be to be prepared to present so uh, student identity verification and distance and correspondence education is an example transfer of credit policies title IV program responsibility documentation and so forth so please do not forget the verification the compliance with federal regulations requirements as part of standard two next slide sean before we move on i just want to point out again that all institutions may not be involved with title right. four program responsibilities or even uh, international institutions may not have to uh, comply with the United States federal regulatory expectations. That does not mean that you get to skip uh, standard two criterion eight um, submission of the, the federal compliance report. These areas, uh, with the exception of the Title IV program responsibilities, are still areas that the commission expects institutions to be in compliance uh, with. And so in that instance, uh, you still would need to submit that documentation and uh, to ensure your compliance with these areas. Thank you. So now let's look at uh, standard three, um, some example documentation. Um, having to do with um, uh, required evidence. There's several items of required evidence noted in the accreditation readiness report. And of course, it also provides alignment with the requirements of affiliation. Um, I also provided some examples toward the bottom of some sample metrics or assessment information that in other institutions have provided on this slide, such as time to degree information, the percentage of full-time faculty, the percentage of faculty with terminal degrees, percentage core expenditure for instruction. Several of these are used as part of the evidence inventory. Again, these are not required by the commission, but they are some of the most common metrics or assessment information or documents, if you will, provided uh, to demonstrate compliance uh, with standard three. Please also note that the commission does not have any sort of, of um, red line expectation where you know, we, we say this is what the percentage full-time faculty must be. Remember that um, the accreditation process is a conversation as much as it is about documentation of compliance when the appropriate time comes. Standard four is the support of the student learn and student experience. And here I simply note that institutions provide a lot of policies and information about practices. They provide financial aid information. This is where a lot of institutions provide the student achievement data. And certainly if you are a for-profit institution and it is in your mission that students will achieve employment, of course, you're going, it's going to be expected of you to provide um, placement rates, job placement rates, and those sorts of things. Standard five is our educational effectiveness assessment standard. Again, the accreditation readiness report re um, presents the requirements of affiliation and the required evidence, but here are some examples of what institutions have provided uh, to demonstrate compliance in either an accreditation readiness report um, situation or in self-study. It's a common practice for institutions to use curriculum maps where you align the required courses with the requisite learning outcomes, program review policies, program review with documentation, specialized accreditor team reports with evidence of follow-up of findings or rubric evaluation results. These are all very commonly used, again, not required. Next slide. 
Standard six is really a combination of three various commission expectations having to do with institutional and unit level assessment, finance, and with strategic planning. So I again list the requisite or the aligned requirements of affiliation with a listing of the required evidence. Most institutions um, provide within this standard uh, the institutional strategic plan. They certainly provide the audit, you know, right? the audited uh, financial statements and so forth. They provide an organizational chart so that out, those outside the institution can understand how resources are employed and so forth. Slides standard seven is governance, leadership, and administration. Information about governing boards, the chief executive officer, and his or her support and administration of the institution. We do provide or require certain pieces of evidence according to the accreditation readiness report, such as the governing bylaws, uh, the governing board documentation, a listing of the names of the board members, probably a good idea to tell us where they're employed, if um, you know where um, uh, or, or what institution they are affiliated with. Um, tell us about your chief executive officer and so forth. So I know I've quickly gone through standards one through seven, but I provide this information to you as only examples of what uh, to date some of the most common documents are. The use of one does not guarantee any specific outcome, but this is for your information to demonstrate that there are really some documents that you may already have. They may come by a different name. It may um, be in a different office than you're familiar with, but it does provide, uh, but, but they may actually be at your institutions. Remember when I said the process for the accreditation readiness report is about gathering and refining and it's an iterative process most of the information that I present evidence by standard has resulted from a iterative process applied institution to institution um, in order to demonstrate to evaluators. Of course, none of this um, that they're in compliance. None of this you know, speaks to labeling or those sorts of things, but at least many institutions uh, are successful and gathering initial documentation. Next slide. So let me talk about a couple of special considerations, that is areas where institutions might have struggled a little bit more than with other things. Um, I don't know if struggle is the right word, but they've had challenges um, with these things. This is just based upon my own sort of uh, observation as I've worked with uh, institutions at the application and the candidacy phase. Um, it's very important to have a structured, what we call a systematic, periodic, and sustained assessment process, both for academic units and for non-academic units. It's important that you be prepared and you do provide evidence to specify what your programmatic goals or learning outcomes are per standard five, or what your unit outcomes are, such as in administrative units, maybe it's enrollment management or a financial aid office. It's advisable to employ multiple measures and methods, but make sure that they're effective and that they're meaningful to you. We do, certainly there are some expectations we would, like I noted before, if you're a for-profit institution, it would be incredibly odd if your mission statement said to offer students jobs or pr preparation for employment, and there was no metric in there about job placement rates. That would be very, very odd. 
Um, so the need to be meaningful and useful, perhaps both to you and to outsiders who happen to be evaluators. You want to, through the process, document progress toward achievement of your goals and outcomes. If you're using assessment information already, if you've already discussed, identified goals, and then as a result, evaluated them and identify and identified strengths and weaknesses, uh, then the next step, which is required for the standards, is to document how that has resulted in the improvement of institutional effectiveness, the improvement of unit outcomes, or the improvement of, uh, of um, institutional outcomes. Next slide. And it's important for, particularly for standard five, but also for, for any time you assess. And remember assessment is, uh, you know, basically the final standard of, uh, final criterion of each standard. It's important to use defensible approaches. For student learning assessment, if you want to interpret results using student survey data might actually be a very, very good thing to do, but student survey data usually do not tell us the extent to which students have achieved the learning outcome of applying grammar correctly or organize the written work. That's usually a more defensible approach would be to evaluate actual samples of student work. So it's important when you are thinking about assessment to, you, uh, to make sure that the assessments you use are aligned with goals, objectives, and competencies um, within uh, courses or required educational experiences that they're authentic, that the results relate to student learning experiences. They're not just opinions or broad re reference inferences, which I call the water cooler conversation. You walked, you know, you walked in having had not slept that night, you're in a bad mood, and so you decide students haven't learned much. That's not a correct inference. So we want to be authentic to look at actual student work samples. It needs to be transferable. In other words, that when the results are presented, the information can be understood, right? It can be understood by those who can make recommendations. And assessment information in order for it to be appropriate or defensible, that the results should be trusted enough to engender conversations and, and to result in actionable uh, recommendations. Next slide. Board governance is a challenge for some institutions because our expectations are actually very, uh, uh, they're very clear, but they're very rig rigorous in terms of aligning with common expectations as they relate to board governance. Um, the board ensures the integrity of the institution's mission. And as such, it is informed about the strategic planning process. It oversees risk and reputational management issues. Um, they guard academic quality. They ensure that the institution is sufficiently autonomous. They protect academic freedom. They guard fiscal integrity of the institution. They play a critical role in selecting, supporting, and assessing the chief executive officer. And yes, they regularly assess their own performance, and they also evaluate their role in overseeing the development and implementation of policies and practice. A board is not just something that we learned about one university, which I'm not going to out here. It's not in our, in our area of the country. Um, where a trustee said, well, all 60 of us board members meet once a year and we're given a bunch of good news. That's not what we see as a governing board. A governing board is involved, respects the autonomy of the chief executive officer, does not get into the weeds, but does provide sufficient oversight to ensure that student learning is effective, to guard fiscal, uh, fiscal integrity, 
and to ensure the integrity of the institution's overall mission. Next slide. And of course, governance requires all six of these, that a board needs to have a clear articulation of responsibilities, usually in the form found in bylaws. Boards need to have a uh, embrace and participate in a culture of accountability. A board needs to have appropriate autonomy, meaning that it protects the mission of the institution and is able to detect when there are issues having to do with such autonomy. I would refer you to the institution's related entities policy, which might be um, important here if that is in play at your institutions. They provide appropriate oversight. Appropriate oversight mean, meaning, again, that they don't get into the weeds. They don't call up the dean of nursing and say, I, I, I require you to open some instructional sites at my favorite hospital, right? That's a decision that is made by others at the institution, okay? It's informed by principles of good practice. The board is aware of what good practice and governance is. And we have many, many governing boards that work very, very well within our membership. Um, and so there's a lot of, of work having been done on what, what good practice means for governance. And of course, an avoidance of conflict of interest, real or apparent. And the governing board works very, very hard to build in evaluation and assessment um, techniques to identify any conflicts of interest that might, crap, uh, might come up. The one thing that um, many institutions do is once a year, they have a disclosure form that institutions that the board members um, uh, complete uh, in order for the board as a whole to identify any weaknesses or any real or apparent conflicts of interest. And of course, there's an assessment of the effectiveness of all this process underlies this as well. Next slide. So let's wrap up a little bit. I'm gonna turn it over to Diana who, um, who, who will do this for us. Great, thank you. Uh, so I want to take an opportunity here to, uh, before we head into the question and answer period, to drive home a couple of important points that uh, we feel are worth emphasis. Uh, so I want to remind you of the information available on the Middle States website. Um, particularly the page that is devoted to application and candidate and candidacy. Um, it des it uh, describes the process and um, also includes links to the various forms um, that we've discussed today, including the accredited accreditation readiness report, as well as the review report that our peer evaluators use to determine the uh, effectiveness and the uh, sufficiency of the accreditation readiness report that the institution has submitted. Um, that website also includes um, a great deal of other information and links that uh, you will find useful in the application process. And certainly uh, a link to the uh, application and candidacy review um, and monitoring procedures and policies. Um, I also want to um, emphasize that the slides that um, we have shown this morning in this presentation and the information that Sean has provided uh, with specificity to uh, commission expectations will be provided to you about a week after. If you have registered for this webinar and are attending, you will receive uh, a link to these slides. Um, I want to remind you that the nature of the application process, again, is iterative. 
and it allows the institution to reflect the changes and improvements that have been made throughout the engagement in this process. So um, as Sean mentioned, it, you may submit more than one uh, application, I'm um, sorry, accreditation readiness report. You may be asked to submit several and that is not unusual. That is a very normal part of this process. Um, and that allows the institution again to demonstrate uh, significant changes as well as institutional improvement that has been made uh, through the process. It is the peer evaluators who make recommendations to the commission. And it is the commission who will ultimately determine whether the institution has sufficiently demonstrated compliance with the standards for accreditation, the requirements of affiliation, the middle states policies and procedures, and the applicable federal regulatory requirements. Again, staff is available to provide advice, guidance, and support throughout this process. So let's take one more look at the learning outcomes to see how we've done. This is the assessment part of the, of the webinar this morning. We hope that uh, at the end of this, you would understand various steps of the application and candidacy review cycle and monitoring procedures. Uh, with emphasis on preparing the accreditation readiness report and preparing for the team visit. Uh, we hope that you would understand the value of mission-centered peer review and that the institution would be prepared and be able to improve within the application process. We wanted to define the purpose and role of the accreditation readiness report within the context of applying for a candidate for accreditation status. So within the context of this process, we wanted to identify expectations for compliance with the commission's uh, standards for accreditation, requirements of affiliation, policies, procedures, and applicable federal regulatory requirements and how those play a part in the accreditation readiness report. And we wanted you to understand the role of evidence and documentation in preparing the ARR. So with that, I want to remind you of how to submit your questions. And I see we have a few in the question answer pod already. Um, so you can, click on the Q&A box and type in your question and we will answer the questions as we receive them. So maybe I can answer one of the questions, Diana, and that is um, expand on graduate one class before accreditation. Uh, it is important, obviously, that your institution be functioning <laughs> with at, at least one person I, at least one class, I'm sorry, has graduated by the time the institution is accredited. We, because we don't really, we, we don't accredit it in, we don't accredit institutions that are not operating, right? And so there is a, there are a series of steps, as Diana's noted, it's an iterative process. So one would anticipate that at least one class will have graduated. So go back to your initial cohort of students who enrolled and then basically, can you calculate a graduation rate, right? I mean, if there's a zero in the numerator, then, then that could be an issue for us. Other questions, happy to answer them. So here's a question, Sean. Do we need to have a graduate cohort for each program that the institution offers or is considered for inclusion into the grant of accreditation? So we accredit institutions. So the, it, is, it is possible that you may have 10, 20 different academic programs and you offer them, they're in your catalog, but uh, there's a number of them that you know, where 
students haven't completed yet. Um, that's certainly permissible. The, the issue is if it's all zeros for all academic programs over three to five years, right, then one wouldn't be able to say that institution has graduated um, at least it's, you know, a gra graduated at least one cohort of students. Sean, I think a piece of this question, if I understood it correctly, might be asking about inclusion into the grant of accreditation. As Sean mentioned, uh, we are an institutional accrediting agency. And what that means is that anything offered by the institution under the, in the institution's name would be included in the scope of the uh, uh, accreditation that is granted by middle states. So um, it would not be permissible for an institution to offer programs that would not be included within the scope of our accreditation. So, so again, if you have a program that you know you've you've um, that you've opened up and gotten the necessary approvals for, but you want to wait a year to enroll in that program, um, we're really not an institution that will say, "How dare you have made that decision?" Right? We look at the institution, and when the institution has in has graduated at least its first, you know, its first, at least one student in its first cohorts, that's what we're looking for. So it is possible for programs to have zero enrollment. It's, it, it's if the institution has zero enrollment and the institution has never graduated anyone where there, there could be issues. So there's a question here, Sean, um, asking us to clarify whether or not graduation requirement is necessary for pre-candidacy or full candidacy. So requirement of affiliation number three states that the institution must have graduated a class by the time the team comes to for its candidacy visit. So that is the visit that takes place at the end of the application process. And so the institution must have graduated a class by the time that visit takes place. Other questions? I, I will just say that um, we have startup institutions, you know, that are going through the pre-applicant stage or have gone through this stage. And of course, if they're a startup institution, um, one wouldn't say, well, three years ago, why didn't you graduate anyone? Because the institution never existed. So um, for them, um, so there's always, institutions always differ in their needs. Uh, and so we're just going, going to say per what Diana shared with us that uh, we need to look carefully to ensure that a student, that a, a cohort of students has graduated within the time frame that we've established. So the strategic plan, must it be fully completed? Um, we, we are building our plan as a synergy document that is constantly being updated. Um, we um, really want you to have completed a strategic plan <laughs> um, because it is in the um, documentation, right? If you look at standard six and so forth, must it, be, must it reference things that don't exist? Not at all but we would expect you to be able to demonstrate to evaluators that you have a, um, that you have a workable uh, strategic plan. Uh, Diana, in your experience, have we had institutions that have never had a strategic plan? I don't think we have. Um, no, I have not um, exper had, have any yeah. experience with so, that. Yeah, and so we'll, I, I will, uh, of course, reach out to me and we'll, we'll chat. I also think, Sean, this is a good point. Um, in terms of institutions moving through the process, it is possible that um, strategic planning is a process, right? And so 
perhaps the cycle of strategic planning has not been completed right. yet, and that's permissible. So there is a strategic plan that has been adopted by the institution. The institution is working the plan, but the plan has not come to its fruition or is not, has not been assessed um, in terms of its effectiveness. That's fine in the process. Right. right. I mean, again, with the example of a startup institution, um, if it's brand new, has never had, had students, those sorts of things, or for that matter, any institution that's an applicant, it's very important to have, um, have developed or show to the evaluators that you have developed what, what appears to be a strategic plan. So it's quite important. Other questions? So I think that's um, not getting any other questions. So, oh, what would be the recommended? I, you know, that's really, um, so we don't have a bright line uh, on student faculty ratio and they differ. So if you were, if your institution were a, the question is about what is the appropriate student faculty uh, ratio? Um, depends on the institution, what sector it's in, what its major fields are. So for example, if 70% of your programs are accredited by CNA um, under the nursing accreditor that has a very stringent student faculty ratio, then your student faculty ratio is gonna be really a lot different than say a more liberal arts institution. So we don't really have a bright line on student faculty ratio, but we wanna be reasonable about it too. If your student faculty ratio is 50 students per faculty, um, that may engender some questions on the part of the evaluators. Uh, if it's two for each faculty member, we congratulate you, but we wonder if that's, you know, it, it might be an open question for an evaluator to say, why is that so low? But we do not have any sort of bright line, and so we can't really recommend it because we have so many different types of institutions. Great question though. Sean, here's another question that you know that we've had quite often, which is, do we have any updates as to when the in-person visits will resume? And my so answer is stay tuned, right? So <laughs> Yes, yes. So the answer is, as Sean indicated, stay tuned. Uh, as you all know, we are, I'm still experiencing um, many different conditions related to the pandemic that um, make visiting in person a challenge for many of us. Um, and so the commission has not yet permitted in-person visits to resume, but we will let you know as soon as that is uh, takes place. We know that we have a number of institutions um, across all levels of and phases of membership and, and candidacy and application um, that are awaiting visits from uh, commission representatives. And so we hope to begin those very soon um, but we don't have that answer for you at this time. So there's a question in chat that came up. Can I include a satellite school that offers certificate or clock hour programs in the accreditation? So there's a couple of key phrases here, Certif a satellite school and certificate or clock hour programs that makes it a little, a little complicated. The satellite school, I'm wondering if that means an instructional site or an additional location where 50% or more of programs can be delivered at that site, then that, that's something we would need to chat about. Um, we have institutions that do clock hour, that 
whose programs do utilize clock hours. So we simply need to be aware of that. Certainly at the pre-application stage, we would want to know about clock hour programs. We would want to know, uh, you know, all of that. But yeah, you can include, I don't know what satellite school means or satellite location. Additional locations, you can have additional locations. In fact, we have several who have additional locations and branch campuses. We just want you to make sure that you disclose that um, to us. And that would have been part of the pre-application process as well as uh, it's embedded in the accreditation readiness report um, in that contextual information section at the very beginning. So I hope that this has been useful. I hope that it's, oh, there's another question. Is there a sp special accreditation process for currently accredited institutions by a national? We do not have, a, yeah, we don't have a special accreditation process. We have a protocol that needs necessarily must be applied to, to everyone. Yep, so the one accreditation or uh, application for a candidate for accreditation process uh, is for all institutions, regardless of their the type, the sector, the uh, accre current accreditation uh, standards or body that um, the institution may belong to. Um, it does not matter. All of those um, feed into our one process and the process is the same. Uh, for all of those institutions. So it may be that we have exhausted either your attention or uh, answered all of your questions um, this morning, um, but if there are questions that you think of after the conclusion of this webinar, you are more than welcome to outreach to the staff, to myself, um, and uh, to or to Sean, um, in order to uh, get your questions resolved um, or find out more about our program. I want to thank you for your attention this morning. I wanna thank my co-host, Dr. McKittrick uh, for his exemplary job um, in explaining some of the nuances of the accreditation readiness report and the expectations of the commission. And I also wanna thank um, my colleagues behind the scenes who made this webinar possible. Uh, so I, we really appreciate our events staff um, for uh, keeping us on track and making this all possible. Uh, again, I invite you to contact us. Uh, you can either contact myself, we are, or you can contact Dr. McKittrick. We are, our information is available on our website in the staff directory. And also on the, uh, I want to remind you again about the webpage for applicant and candidate institutions. Uh, and you can contact applications process at msche.org. So thank you again for your attention. Bye-bye and thank you, Diana. Bye-bye.